was on. At first, the first Jewish revolt succeeded, and the Jewish forces quickly expelled the unprepared Roman army. Then, the rebels gained some traction in the neighboring villages in Galilee. In response, the Roman Emperor Nero sent the General Vespasian to meet the Jewish forces, an endeavor that pushed most rebels into Jerusalem proper by the time Vespasian was proclaimed Emperor in 69 CE. Then, around Passover in 70 AD, Vespasian and his forces sieged the city, depleting it of food and water within the walls of Jerusalem. The Jews started to quarrel within, leaving them more vulnerable to attack. By August, the Romans breached the defenses, killed much of the population, and destroyed many of their holy sites. With the Jews decimated, the strength of polytheism lived long. Then, in 98 to 117 AD, under Emperor Trajan, the Roman Empire was able to expand its greatest territorial extent, spanning all the way from modern-day Britain to the Persian Gulf. Roman rule was everywhere. Well, except for in the Americas, because the Romans didn't even know they existed. In the Americas, we can see the growth of various civilizations across the Andes located in modern-day Peru and Chile. The Mochi civilization was able to build monumental structures, like the Huaca del Sol and Huaca de la Luna, impressive pyramids that were the center of their religions. They also created advanced fertilization techniques that used bird droppings as fertilizer. Their highly centralized government made everyone know their place in society. While a little bit more south, the Nazca civilization is one enthralled in mystery. The people of Nazca created a series of large-scale geoglyph consisting of hundreds of individual figures, including geometric shapes, animals, and human-like figures, by removing the dark reddish-brown iron oxide-coated pebbles covering the surface of the Nazca Desert. These lines are now called Nazca Lines, the purpose of which is still unknown to this day and subject to conspiracy theory today. Around 100 AD, the Zapotecs started establishing Monte Alban, their capital. It was one of the first examples of urban planning in the Americas. The city was laid out in a grid pattern, with main roads and smaller side streets leading to plazas and public buildings. The city was also divided into different districts, each with specialized functions, such as residential, administrative, and religious, leaving it to be in use for a thousand years after that. While back in Rome, after the end of Trajan's reign in 117 AD, a new emperor with a purpose was in hand. Hadrian was a man tasked with a near impossible, keeping the massive Roman Empire under one rule. He first had to deal with a crisis with the newly colonized Roman Britain. Like their predecessors in Judea, the Roman Brits did not like being Roman, so they started to cause unrest, and in the eyes of Hadrian, a real threat of revolution was on his mind. So Hadrian had ordered a massive wall, aptly named Hadrian's Wall, which spanned almost coast to coast, keeping it sunk in the conquered people's minds that the Romans were here, staving off revolution in one region. However, in Galilee, things weren't as peaceful. Simon bar Kokhba led a rebellion of the Jewish people to free themselves from Roman rule. As you see, Rome was developing a new city, called Aelia Capitolina, over the ruins of Jerusalem, from the last revolt with temples dedicated to polytheistic gods like Jupiter. By 132, Bar Kokhba took the bottle of Nasi, head of state. Many Jews regarded him as the Messiah who would save the Jewish people and restore their independence. Kokhba's troops would storm Aelia Capitolina almost knocking out entirely the Roman garrison controlling the city. Hadrian, though, would not have it, so he sent a force of 120,000 men to the lands of Judea to conquer and force the Jewish people into submission. As Cassius Dio says in the History of Rome, 50 of their most important outposts and 985 of their most famous villages were razed. 580,000 men were slain in the various raids and battles. 
and the number of those that perished by famine, disease, and fire was past finding out. Thus, nearly the whole of Judea was made desolate. History of Rome 69.14 1-2 Rome made it clear that it was not to be taken lightly. While in China, the message was quite different. The ideas of Buddhism were spreading, along with the Chinese philosophies of Confucianism and Taoism, and built a dynasty. These three philosophies worked together to make the Han Dynasty stronger and more united in many ways. While in America, the Mayan architects went across northern Petén and designed a series of short, broad temples with wide staircases flanked by enormous stucco masks. These stucco masks were made of plaster, and some burned in powdered limestone. The Mayans built these stone armatures into elaborate deity faces to capture the soul of the gods and bring it to the people. A temple like the E7 Sub, yes, historians name Mayan temples like military submarines, is a pyramid with 16 stucco masks. Each allows us to go deeper into the souls of these deities of the past. In the Middle East, a new empire was emerging with roots in the past. A man named Ardashir claimed to have royal blood that traced all the way back to Cyrus the Great. Ardashir claimed that he should be the true ruler of the Persian Empire, not those frauds of the Parthians. Ardashir was able to unite the various tribes of Persia. In 224 AD, Ardashir I led his forces against the Parthian king Artabanus V in a significant battle at Hermazgon. The Sasanian forces, known for their cavalry, defeated the Parthians and captured Artabanus V. With this victory, Ardashir I declared himself king and established the Sasanian Empire. Ardashir I quickly established a centralized government and built a new capital at Tijafon on the Tigris River. He re-established the Zoroastrian religion, which had been suppressed by the Parthians as the empire's official religion. He also built a powerful military machine with skilled cavalry and archers. He began to expand his territory by conquering neighboring regions. As the Parthians were on their way out, so were the Han. The Han Dynasty's downfall was marked by political instability, economic problems, external threats, internal rebellions, and power struggles. The weakening of central authority allowed regional warlords to seize power, and the government's attempts to address economic issues were unsuccessful. External threats and rebellions weakened the dynasty even further. A warlord named Cao Pi declared himself emperor and established the Wei dynasty, officially ending the Han dynasty. While back in Rome, Emperor Diocletian (284-305) faced a problem. Rome was becoming too large and impossible to manage. So Diocletian created the Tetrarchy and divided the region into four, where each region was governed by a separate emperor. Within the Tetrarchy, there were two types of emperors: Augustus and Caesars. Diocletian chose Maximian to be his equal to Augustus. In contrast. Gallerus and Constantius were appointed to be Caesars. However, this system created uncontrolled chaos and anarchy. Each emperor had desires for power and ambition, and it all came to a head in 305 when power shifted. Both Diocletian and Maximian retired, and in 306, Constantius died. Three out of the four original leaders were left out of the system, leading to a power vacuum to come. Emperor Constantine the Great was appointed by his father's army unilaterally as an Augustus and a Caesar at the same time to replace his father. At the same time, Maximin's son Maxentius felt as though he should have been appointed Caesar instead of Valerius Severus. So in 307, Maxentius sent his army and forced Valerius Severus to surrender. Come 308, Gallerus appointed Licinius to replace him. So, on the west side of Rome, two emperors wanted to rule. Constantine ruled over Gaul and Britain, and Maxentius ruled Italy and North Africa. 
Maxentius had a difficult time consolidating his power, and he faced increasing resistance from the people of Rome. To try and secure his hold on power, Maxentius ordered the construction of a new bridge across the Tiber River near Rome, known as the Milvian Bridge. Constantine saw Maxentius as a threat to his power, so he decided to march on Rome to confront him. As the two armies approached each other near the Milvian Bridge, Constantine had a vision of a cross in the sky, with the words, in this sign, conquer. Some accounts suggest that this vision may have been a dream or a hallucination, while others suggest that it may have been a sign from God. Regardless of the nature of the vision, Constantine took it as a sign that he would be victorious in battle if he fought under the sign of the Christian cross. He had his soldiers paint this symbol on their shields and banners, and he went into battle with renewed vigor and confidence. The battle was fierce and brutal, with both sides suffering heavy losses. Maxentius had a larger army, but his troops were spread out and disorganized. Constantine was able to take advantage of this, and he was able to push Maxentius' forces back towards the Tiber River. In the chaos of the retreat, Maxentius was forced off the Milvian Bridge and into the water, where he drowned. Shortly after his victory, Constantine met Licinius at Mediolanum, modern Milan, to confirm several political and dynastic arrangements to produce the Edict of Milan. This edict gave power for Eastern Rome to Licinius and Constantine's sole power of the West. More importantly though, this document extended religious tolerance for Christians and restored any properties confiscated from them during the persecution. However, the peaceful coexistence of both rulers was short-lived. Though the edict allowed for the safety of Christians, Licinius was still very much a paganist. Their differences started to grow. All came near the city of Chrysopolis in 324 AD, where both armies went and fought. Constantine's military might was on display. He was able to force the Eastern Roman army towards the sea, leaving many to be killed or captured. Constantine was declared the sole leader of Rome, and Licinius was declared dead by hanging. He renamed the Eastern Roman capital from Byzantium to Constantinople to celebrate his victory. Then in 325 AD, Constantine presided over the First Council of Nicaea, when the 300 bishops established the now famous Nicene Creed, which declared that Jesus Christ was begotten, not made, and of one substance with the Father. Constantine was finally baptized as a Christian on his deathbed in 337 AD. Come 370 AD, a new player was on the scenes. The Huns were a barbaric nomadic civilization who were masters of warfare. According to legends, they were taught horsemanship as early as the age of three. Also, they would attack their own with a sword to teach them how to endure pain. These people weren't to be messed lightly with. When they crossed the Volga River in 370 on their horses and lusted for blood, the Alan civilization didn't stand much chance. Two years later, they attacked the Ostrogoths, an eastern tribe of Germanic Goths who harassed the Roman Empire by frequently attacking their territories. By 376, the Huns had attacked the Visigoths, the western tribe of Goths, and forced them to seek sanctuary within the Roman Empire. As the Huns dominated Goth and Visigoth lands, they earned a new reputation as the new barbarians in town, and seemed unstoppable. By 395 AD, they began invading Roman domains, and some Roman Christians believed they were devils who arrived straight from hell. The reason they started invading Rome was because of the death of Theodosius the Great. His shining achievement as emperor was keeping the Goths and the Huns at bay. But on death, he decided to follow the ideas of Diocletian and split the empire up again. Splitting up control between his two sons, Arcadius in the east and Honorius in the west, making Theodosius the last leader of a united Rome. With Honorius in charge, the incapable general made Western Rome an easy target to be bullied. The Visigoths, looking for a new place to live, had their eyes set on Rome. 
So throughout the early 410s, the Visigoths ransacked various Roman cities. Then, on August 24, 410, the Visigoths sacked Rome, taking control of this historic city. It was the first time in nearly 800 years that a foreign army occupied the city of Rome. However, the Visigoths couldn't maintain control of Rome. Instead, they continued to ransack Roman territories until they established their kingdom in 418 in modern-day Spain. While the prospects of existence weren't so much better in Eastern Rome, the notorious Attila the Hun was gaining power and his brutal tactics called him the Scourge of God. After a failed peace attempt in 441, Attila and his army stormed through the Balkans and the Danube frontier. Another peace treaty was forged in 442, but Attila attacked again in 443, killing, ransacking, and pillaging his way to the well-fortified city of Constantinople. However, due to Constantinople's high walls, Attila couldn't conquer it. Instead, Attila was able to muster another peace agreement. He would leave Constantinople alone in exchange for an annual tribute of 2,100 pounds of gold, a staggering sum. Then in 451, the Huns invaded the Gauls, allowing the once enemies of the Visigoths and the Romans to wise up and work together to fight the Huns. According to legend, the night before the imminent battle, Attila consulted sacrificed bones and saw that thousands of his army would fall in the fight. The next day, his premonition came true. In the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, after hours of ferocious fighting, tens of thousands of soldiers lay dead, giving Attila his first and only military defeat in history. However, even after the loss, Attila and his army marched on and returned to Italy, continuously ravaging the cities. In 452, with Roman sight, he met Pope Leo I, who acted as an emissary between Attila and Rome. There's no record of what they discussed. Still, according to legend, the apparitions of St. Paul and St. Peter appeared to Attila. They threatened to kill him if he didn't negotiate with Pope Leo I. Attila decided to pull out of Italy and return to the Great Hungarian Plain. Whether because of his fear of the Pope and his saintly allies, or because of his troops were stretched too thin and weakened by malaria. However, the struggle for Western Rome wasn't over. In 476 AD, the young Emperor Romulus Augustus had trouble keeping power for himself, as many Romans felt he was illegitimate. So the Eastern Roman Empire sent the Germanic general Odoacer and his mercenaries to suppress a revolt by the Roman army in the region. However, instead of supporting the Eastern Roman Empire, Odoacer saw an opportunity to seize power for himself. He turned against the Roman government and deposed the last Western Roman Emperor, Romulus Augustus, effectively marking the end of the Western Roman Empire. As the steps of his victory, Odoacer was declared the King of Italy. However, Odoacer's victory was short-lived because in 493, Theodoric the Great of the Ostrogoths, with the support of Eastern Roman Emperor Zeno, came in and created the Ostrogothic Kingdom of Italy, sending Odoacer to meet his fate. While Europe was in the crux of a dark age, India under the Gupta Empire was in a mathematical golden age. Great mathematicians like Brahmagupta started using zero as a placeholder and as various solutions for mathematical equations. The astronomer Aribata was able to calculate the circumference of the Earth. He proved the world was round long before it was globally accepted. Aribata was also able to develop methods for calculating pi and square roots. However, his crowning achievement was creating the concept of an asymptote which is a line that approaches the curve but never touches it. The Franks under Clovis I had been engaged with the Alemanni, another Germanic tribe, and tensions between the two groups were running high. In 496 AD, in the Battle of Tolbaic, Clovis I led his forces into battle against the Alemanni, with both sides eager to gain the upper hand in the ongoing struggle for power and territory. 
As the Alamanni began to push the Franks to defeat, in a moment of desperation, Clovis called out to the Christian god for assistance, promising to convert to Christianity if he emerged victorious. According to legend, a sudden thunderstorm appeared, and the Franks could regroup and launch a successful counterattack against the Alamanni. The battle ended in a decisive victory for the Franks, and Clovis kept his promise and converted to Christianity officially cementing Christianity to the forefront and birthing the Frankish kingdom. While the Western Roman Empire might have fallen, in the East, the Roman Empire was changing. Many historians argue that the Eastern Roman Empire, based out of Constantinople, should be considered a part of Rome. However, it is undeniable that under Justinian I would lead the Eastern half into its next chapter in life the Byzantine Empire. Whether it's a continuation of the Roman Empire before is a debate for another under. Under the leadership of Justinian I, like many Roman emperors before him, he would expand the Byzantine Empire to reach places such as Italy, North Africa, and even Spain. He also commissioned a team of legal scholars to codify all the laws of the Roman Empire, known as the Corpus Juris Civilis which became the basis of the European laws we know today. He also commissioned the world-renowned Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, where this beautiful cathedral, adorned with intricate mosaics and marble decorations, became the head of the Eastern Orthodox Church. However, Jesus wasn't the only prophet at the time. In the small town of Mecca, a nomadic tribe called the Quraysh gave birth to a man who would change the religious world yet again, Muhammad. Muhammad was orphaned at an early age and was raised by his grandfather and later his uncle. As he grew up, he worked as a merchant, which earned him the nickname Al-Amin, meaning the trustworthy. On one of his pilgrimages in 610, Muhammad meditated in a cave on Mount Jabal i Nur. The angel Gabriel appeared and relayed the word of God. Recite in the name of your Lord who creates. Creates a man from a clot. Recite for your Lord is most generous. Became the opening verses of Surah, chapter 96 of the Quran. At first, Muhammad was reluctant, not knowing how to disclose this information. However, soon enough, Muhammad began to gather a small following, which was mocked by the pagans of Mecca. However, when Muhammad denounced idol worship, the leader of Mecca knew that he was through. So through the resistance from Mecca, Muhammad and his followers were eventually forced to emigrate to Medina, a city 260 miles away. There, Muhammad was instrumental in ending various civil wars, creating a prosperous Muslim community. Nevertheless, this prosperity would be challenged by the members of Muhammad's old tribe the Quraysh and their allies, who marched up to Medina with a large army to attack the Muslims. Muhammad devised a plan that they could defend the city if they dug a trench around its perimeter, making it near impossible for enemy forces to penetrate. For several weeks, the Quraysh tried to break through the trench, trying and trying yet again. Eventually, strong wind and heavy rain caused the Quraysh forces to abandon the siege marking the Muslims as victorious. In 630, the Muslim army marched into Mecca, taking the city with minimum casualties. Muhammad gave amnesty to the enemy leaders who once opposed him, converting most of the Meccan population to Islam. At the time of Muhammad's death, the Muslims had successfully united the Arabian Peninsula under the banner of Islam. After Muhammad's death, a series of caliphs, or leaders, took over the leadership of the Muslim community, beginning with Abu Bakr, a close companion of the Prophet. Under the leadership of the caliphs, the Muslim community continued to expand its territory, conquering new lands and spreading the message of Islam. At first, Abu Bakr had his eyes set on the Byzantine Empire's provinces of Syria, taking over the crucial cities of Damascus and Jerusalem. Then in 636, the Arab forces invaded the Sassanid Empire, taking over their capital city in 637. 
marking the end of the Sassanid Empire. Onward to Egypt they went, where after years of fighting, they successfully defeated the Byzantine to take over the city of Alexandria in 642 AD, economically crippling the Byzantines. By 716, the Arab forces had conquered much of North Africa, Carthage, and Spain, so that by 716, the Arabs had an extensive empire from Lisbon to China. After consolidating their hold on the Iberian Peninsula, the Arabs launched raids into neighboring Francia, modern-day France. In 732 AD, they launched a significant invasion to expand their territory northward. The Arabs' forces, led by Emir Abdul Rahman al-Ghafiqi, quickly conquered several cities in the region, including Bordeaux and Tours. However, Charles Martel, the military leader of the Franks, assembled a large army to meet the Arabs in battle. The Battle of Christianity versus Islam. Both empires wanted to keep their own faith. The Arabs wanted to impose their religion onto the Franks. The two forces clashed near Tours on October 10, 732 AD. The battle was fierce and lasted several days, with both sides suffering heavy casualties. In the end, though, Charles Martel and the Franks emerged victorious, and the Arab forces were forced to retreat back to Spain, ending the massive expansion of the Arabic Empire. While in the West, the definition of God was war. In China, during the rule of the Tang, religions like Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism all coexisted peacefully. A citizen was able to believe what they wanted to believe, leaving for many temples and pagodas to be built across the empire. Also during the Tang, the height of Chinese poetry was upon us. Poets like Li Po and Du Fu created poems that later became the foundations of Chinese literature. Li Po wrote a poignant poem called Zanzen on the Qing Thing Mountain, translated by Sam Hamill. The birds have vanished down the sky, now the last cloud drains away. We sit together, the mountain and me, until only the mountain remains. Charlemagne, also known as Charles the Great, became the king of the Franks in 768. Charlemagne was a skilled military leader who expanded the Frankish Empire through successful campaigns. He conquered much of Western Europe, including modern-day France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. Charlemagne was also a devout Christian and worked to spread Christianity throughout his empire. In 785, Heron was declared caliph instead of focusing on conquering like his brethren. He instead focused on the scientific growth in the new capital city of Baghdad. Harun al-Rashid wanted to create the House of Wisdom, a library and research center that attracted scholars from around the world. These scholars would come to the House of Wisdom with the desire to learn. They've translated the works of the past, as well as developing the science of algebra, chemistry, sociology, and the concept of infinity. While the Vikings had a different idea of progress. The Vikings were a group of uncivilized pagans from modern-day Scandinavia who wanted to gain material wealth. So June 8, 793 AD marked the beginning of the Viking Age in Europe. Lindisfarne was a small, isolated island off the northeast coast of England that was home to a famous monastery and considered one of Europe's most important centers of learning. On the day of the raid, a group of Viking warriors, likely from Norway or Denmark, landed on the island and attacked the monastery. The Vikings pillaged the monastery, killing many monks and taking others as slaves. The raid was a brutal and unexpected attack on a place of great religious and cultural significance, and it sent shockwaves throughout Europe. In 799, in Rome, Pope Leo III was attacked by a faction of Rome who believed that the Pope was guilty of tyranny and serious personal misconduct. So Pope Leo III ran away to the Frankish kingdom. After this, Charlemagne and his Frank army provided an escort for the Pope and restored him to the papal office. But yet, the power of the papacy was being questioned. 
with many people wanting it to go away, which caused Charlemagne to go to Rome in late 800 to fight for his pope. For his loyalty, on Christmas Day in the Basilica of St. Peter, Pope Leo III placed a crown on Charlemagne's head, declaring him the new Holy Roman Emperor, creating a new Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, or at least the first rendition of it. Under Charlemagne, the foundations of a genuinely great empire were forming, but once Charlemagne died in 814, the new empire was bludgeoning with problems. His son, Louis the Pious, 788-840, inherited an empire filled with problems. Many of his own citizens viewed him as a strong Catholic who was well-intentioned but was incredibly weak and unable to do anything. As the Vikings continued their raids along the Rhine River, attacking Holy Roman Empire cities such as Cologne, Trier, and Mainz, raiding various Catholic monasteries, and destroying religious artifacts caused fear and hatred among his citizens. Why would anyone trust a leader if they can't stop barbaric pagans? So, various local leaders started to focus on defending their land, rather than relying on the central government for defense. Hence beginning the process of independently recreating the Chinese system of feudalism. At this time, people would willingly farm on lands, giving up their freedom to these local leaders to protect them from the Vikings, creating the basis of a new system of feudalism. While the Holy Roman Empire might have been fighting with the Vikings and the Byzantines were fighting with the Arabs, in 820, a group of Arab raiders landed on the island of Crete. Over the next several years, Arab forces gradually gained control of the island, overcoming the resistance of the Byzantine defenders. The conquest was completed in 827 and Crete became part of the Arab Empire. The conquest of Sicily and Sardinia followed a similar pattern. In 827, a large Arab fleet landed on Sicily, and Arab forces quickly gained control of much of the island. They then moved on to Sardinia, which fell to the Arab invaders in 828. In the Holy Roman Empire, once Louis the Pious died in 840 AD, so did the Charlemagne Empire. The infighting between family members grew, leading to the Holy Roman Empire being divided between three family members in the famous Treaty of Verdun. In the West, the formation of the West Frankish Kingdom was given to Charlemagne's grandson, Charles the Bald in modern-day France. In the East, the East Frankish Kingdom was given to another grandson, Louis the German, which was obviously settled in modern-day Germany, while the Middle Kingdom was given to Charlemagne's eldest son, Lothair. However, being squeezed in between the West and East Frankish Kingdoms gave the Middle Kingdom a short lifespan and was practically irrelevant. The Vikings weren't just a problem for mainland Europe, they were pillaging everything in mainland England. So in 871, the new king of Wessex, Alfred the Great, rose to power with one thing in mind, keeping everyone safe. Alfred built a network of fortifications known as burrs, designed to protect his people from Viking attacks. He also developed new military tactics and strategies and fostered alliances with other Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Unlike in Great Britain, though, the Vikings were actually invited to Russia. According to Russian legend, the tribes in Russia were tired of dealing with political strife, so they invited the Varangians, a sect of Vikings, to establish order and a government over there. Hence, Rurik came with his two brothers to the city of Novgorod, and using the Vikings' famous force, they were able to establish order in the city, declaring Rurik as their new king creating the Kievan Rus dynasty. Under the military leadership of Oleg, one of the Rurik king's